Hey, welcome in everybody as we're here at the next Sports Fanatic News Sixers cast episode as we're here to give an update on the Sixers in the holiday season. Update edition, just like we did on the Philadelphia Flyers the other day. Uh, first and foremost, Andrew, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing pretty good. Nice, fun-filled weekend. I get to travel home here shortly, so I'm, I'm pretty excited. Yeah, when are you heading back, today or tomorrow? I'm going to head back tomorrow morning, so finish up work here tonight and then get get on the road and, or fly and get on the road to the airport and then flying home tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say that's a long drive if you're going to come back for a few days. <laughs> <laughs> but um, let's get right into it, though. Um, When it comes to the Sixers this year, obviously they've gone through hell and back with injuries, the COVID protocol, and um, whatnot to have them at the 15 and 15 record, five and five in their last 10. Um, to start off, what are your just like basic observations of the team this far that that you've seen that are like two negative observations this far that have to change and then like two positive things that that you've seen this far to start off the podcast? Yeah, I think it's a multiple uh, things. I think there's multiple different conclusions you can take so far from this year. Um, I think the biggest thing is, listen, whether we like Sims or not, they miss him right now. I mean, we're used to having that that force, and I think that's a major negative so far. I, I think they're never agreed to it, but I think it's bothering them more than they're willing to admit. I think they miss him on the court in terms of that third star. I mean, the way the NBA is now, you need three stars to win games. And right now, you you got two. You got Embiid and Harris. And Harris thrived off of having Simmons there for the three point the open three-point shot. And it's quite clear. You see that in his percentage drop. So, I mean, until you get that whole situation figured out, I think you're going to continue to hover around the six through eight seed. Um, obviously, I think it's positive the way they've been able to survive the injuries, the COVID cases and all that, where you're still in that seventh spot. So, I think there's a lot of different things to look look to, but I think that's the biggest negative is you're basically playing down one superstar all year. And listen, I mean, I know if you want to be the best, you got to be able to win and stuff. Just like the Nets, they're finding ways to win without Kyrie. But let's face it, Durant and Harden are better superstars than what the Sixers have. So that's why they're able to. Also, take- when you have a super, when your ultimate superstar, because like let's face it, Tobias is a really solid player, but like Joe on B to Tobias Harris, like when your okay. ultimate superstar is a center. It like it's no offense to Embiid. It just limits you a little bit more than if it's Kevin Durant, who like the other game, the other day, when all their got when Harden was out, stepped up as the point guard. In the last couple of games, Harden has been out. Where it's not like now Embiid probably could do it with his ball handling, like Jokic did the one. But it's not like you're going to be like, oh, Joel, all of our point guards are out. Uh, you're running the point tonight. Like that would be a really odd. That would be like when the Phillies let off like the most random people of all time and you're like wait this random dude that I never heard of is leading off today oh okay cool good for him um like uh like I feel like the Sixers this year I think Doc's kind of said it at times my biggest negative this far has been he said it the other game I'm trying to remember which loss it was because obviously of late we've unfortunately (laughs) uh, been struggling a little bit I think it was the heat loss um but Like, there just wasn't much, like, basically paraphrasing what he said, because I can't remember the exact word he used, but, like, much heart in that game at the start, and then you started having comebacks, and that kind of brought you back, and the same thing happened in the next game. There wasn't much heart at the start, and then it was like, okay, pick back up, pick back up, pick back up, and then they obviously, the rant just flattened us in the end, and the, the, the rest was history, but... um I feel like the big thing for me that's been a negative as far as we've had people out, but we haven't taken advantage of the teams that also have had people out. Like like we had like the heat had Jimmy Butler out and um, what was it? Three leading scorers. Yeah. They had the three leading scorers out. And that one guy, Vincent, who I honestly, I'm not going to lie, did not hear of until that game. Like I'm not, I did not know who Gabe Vincent was until that game when he dropped 26 on us. So like, I, I feel like the Sixers are every, every Philly team's like this, but they always just have a random guy that goes off against them. It happens if you're the Eagles. It happens if you're the Flyers. It happens if you're the, but it's like <laughs> yeah, but like I feel like that's been my biggest negative. Like we've had guys out, but we haven't stepped up against teams that have also had a million tons of people out. That's why I was pissed at the Flyers the other day to bring it across the pond real quick because they didn't step up against the Canadians. I don't care if we have a couple people out. They had like 12 people out. So like, I, like that, I don't, I think that's the biggest thing 
uh, I've seen this far. But a question I have to ask you, because you brought up Harris, I saw when they did, I want to say it was Sixers Talk. It was one of the YouTube podcasts I listened to about the Sixers. But um, they were talking about how he, it could be because of Ben, like you said, but like he hasn't stepped up to the effect of what you would expect your secondary guy to do at the end of games. They were kind of hint, like saying and talking about where, what, what's your take on the fact that Embiid seems like the only closer, so to speak, on, on the Sixers? Like, is that something that you think is going to be pretty damning as it goes through through the season? Especially since your only closer is a center. So that limits you. It's nothing against him, but that does limit you a little bit. Yes and no, because I think the big thing here is, yeah, he's not a superstar, but he's a star. I mean, I think in in situations where if you need a, a shot where your center's not going to hit it, Curry's the best shooter on the team. So, I mean, I think we'd all agree. I'd rather Curry taking that final shot than Harris totally would be if you need a big shot like that. Um, I think it's lost. I think, listen, when – the Sixers signed Tobias. They signed Tobias because they lost Jimmy Butler. So you couldn't lose two stars in one offseason. And I think that's where people get lost. In. And Sixers offered him a Supermax contract. Is he a Supermax contract player? No, but he never was. That was what, And that's what people don't realize. And, and that's people are trying to compare it to his contract and saying all that. Well, I mean, if you're offered a Supermax max contract are you going to turn that down today just because you think you're getting overpaid i don't think so no, like, yeah, exactly, yeah. i think that's the, i think that's the big thing here is tobias has never been a number two guy like he's always gonna and that's why i think he's a fantastic three four player on the team and he's and he's a guy that's gonna help you win a championship but i think when we signed him i mean i think when he was here with jimmy i mean you had Embiid, you had butler you had simmons i mean those are all guys that were better than harris that's why it's right. underneath him yeah so they he, were like, he was be, like the fourth fiddle yeah yeah, we didn't want to lose two superstars in one off season, so that's why that deal was made. And obviously, yeah, he's a little he's a little overpaid, but he's still a phenomenal player and still going to try to get the job done. So I think, again, I, I don't think this situation is going to be figured out until you figure out the Simmons situation. Whether that's both sides coming to coming halfway, agreeing on stuff, and finding a way to get him back on the court, or if it's finally making the trade and getting stuff in. I, I mean. That's just the way the NBA is today. I think you're gonna see, you're gonna see it throughout the whole season, um, and uh-huh. yeah, is it gonna stink and frustrating? Yeah, absolutely. But Harris, yeah, he's getting paid like he should be a, a two. But I think the big thing with and listen, the only part of his game that really has gone down this year is the three point shooting. His rebounding numbers are up. His assist numbers are up. His scoring is only a half point smaller than what it used to, usually is. Um, career-wise and since he's joined the Sixers. So that's the big thing here is he, he's just struggling from behind the arc, and, and that, that goes to show, I mean, Simmons was able to create a lot more shots for Harris than Max he's going to be, and that's where he's really lacking it. So in terms yeah. of the closure, I, I think, yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to loom this team for a long time until you get that Simmons trade figured out and bring in another second guy, but that, that's on more at this point. Yeah. I mean, I think Maxi. We saw how he started the season as a fi- like hot as a firecracker. He's a young player, so I mean, he's going to go through what he's going through now, which is and now he's also banged up. But like before that happened, uh, where he goes through a little bit of a lull period, and then has to br- has to bring it back up. So, I mean, I think I think that's to be expected. But real quick before we move on to the next question on Maxi. Uh, he's we we've, we've heard when people called into radio and I seen it in Sixers Reddit in the fan groups. Is it overblown already how Maxi's stats were very good without Joel in the lineup, similar to Russ when uh, LBJ's been out of the lineup in the Lakers organization this year, where with him in the lineup not so sweet, where it looks like he's overthinking things because he doesn't want to drive the like get, like that type of. Is that overblown early? Because to me, it seems like it's just a young player trying to figure out how to play with the star that he hasn't really played with much yet. I think that's exactly it. I think we'll see if how long it continues. But I think yeah, you have a guy that wasn't used to playing with Embiid last year, really, because yeah, he's coming off the bench, so he's getting mixed in with a bunch of different guys. Um, you have a guy that likes to drive. And I think we talk about all the time, when Embiid's on the floor, you want to surround him with shooters. And Maxi isn't really... Yeah, he can hit a three here and there. Here and there, but yeah, he's not. Yeah, he's not your typical three point shooter. And I think that's again, you're you're now you now have a lineup instead of having Simmons on the floor as a point guard mixing with a, a Green and a Curry and a Harris getting the open shots, you now have Maxie who's quicker 
than Simmons, and it's going to bring the defense up, so it's not creating um, as many open shots for him. So you're having contested threes now and um, more contested threes than usual, so it's kind of creating almost more of a log jam there. So I think, again, you have a, a second-year point guard running the floor, so, yeah, it's going to take a little bit to figure out. You're not used to having that. But he's able to get the job done and score, and, and he makes up for it when – and beat isn't on the floor. And yeah, he went through that rough patch, but the young guy made the adjustments, and I think he scored 20 plus points in his last three games. So I mean, I want to say he's back to the way he looked in the beginning of the year. So if he can just become more consistent with his jump shot, I think that would go a long way. Yeah, and he's only like I said, was he 21? I think Tyrese. He just turned 21. If, I think wasn't his that, birth- I think yeah, he left I that his freshman year. Yeah, he is 21. Yeah, because his birthday was the fourth of um. November, so last month it was. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but I think the big issue with this team, just from me watching, um, has been in past years, like you would, you just mentioned it, shooters around and beat. We have Seth Curry, <laughs> where, where Ferk started off hot and then has been insanely cold. Uh, Isaiah Joe, I'm not putting that much pressure. Like, I'm not blaming a dude that should be developing still in the G League for having to play the minutes he has to play where I think he's actually looked, he's kind of like the Nick sealer of the Sixers where it's like, nobody expected this dude to play as much as he's playing. And you're like, well, he's looked okay for what he's done, but he shouldn't be playing like how, how he's had to play. Cause you should have another roster player that you're like, Oh, we can go to him if, if we need shooting. Um, so like if you're the Sixers, like what, what do you think about that aspect where like, it seems like the shooting having to go so much through and beat having like the couple 40 point games when he doesn't even feel fully healthy yet. Like, it seems like the shooting has really been holding this team back this year compared to past years where we would be more consistent at the three, especially guys like green um, where like now you basically just have Seth Curry. That's actually really consistent from out there. And Joel, who's a really good shooting center, but you don't want your center shooting threes, obviously consistently. Yeah, I know people aren't going to like that. I'm going to use this card here, but I think we got to remember that we did go through the whole COVID outbreak, and I think that has an effect on the whole game. Um, late in the game, it causes players to be more tired than usual um, until they get their shape back. And and my proof here is, look at Seth Curry last year. Remember when he got off that historic career start? He gets off, and we didn't have an outbreak last year, but Curry got it, and then he missed all that time, and he came back, and he was far from the same player until – close to the playoffs when he was finally getting his legs back under him. So that's kind of the same thing here. I mean, in a way, yeah, I mean, would rather it happen early in the year, and that's what happened. So now it's going to take a little bit to, to get back. And, I mean, we'll, we'll take Embiid for an example. He was talking about how bad it hit him. So it's going to – I mean, we saw him struggle his first games back, and then Harris comes back. Two games later, he gets sick again, and then he misses more time. So we got to remember – that, that that's definitely going to play a factor into it. I mean, studies show it, scientists have said it, doctors have said it. Like, you're not going to come back 100% in the snap of a finger. So, we got to remember, on top of all that, they got to work because they're, they're playing every. I mean, well, Harris yeah. also quoted said he feels like he, I can't remember the exact quote, but he feels like he has a cold basically every day still. Exactly. Like I remember exactly. seeing that when somebody yeah. tweeted that out. Yeah, and I've had it before too, and it's, it's not fun. Um, it, it takes a little bit, and we had three games this week. So, yeah, by the time you get to that Nets game, they're going to show some some fatigue and all that. Um, you had a game, I think it was Monday against the Grizzlies, Wednesday against the Heat, and then Thursday against the uh, Nets. I mean, yeah. Yeah, that was right. Have, yeah, Monday, Wednesday, We're just going to have fatigue and stuff. So, I mean, yeah, obviously I want to win. And obviously Plus, I, we won Saturday against Golden State. So, if you had that, that's Saturday, only a day off Monday, only a day off Wednesday, and then back-to-back exactly. to the Thursday. So. So, I mean, I think that all plays a factor into it. I think, yeah, again, I think that the floor looks more congested and not spreading out as much as we saw in the past. I think that's caused some of the shooting issues as well. And because, I mean, that's a we haven't, we, that is a good point. I mean, as, as, as big of a crazy to say off the bench here, but Niang's been such a good player off the bench, a stretch four and everything. We haven't had him in the last few games. And he's been I, banged up there. Yeah, or he's been out. Or is he protocol? Or is he has he been banged up? I can't remember because a couple guys are injured and a couple guys are protocol. I, he's I, protocol now at Furcon. He's protocol. Okay, gotcha. Because That's I know thing. Ty Reese and um, he's the quad, and then yeah, uh, what's his name? I thought was also uh, and beads always keep getting the back tag, but then he plays the game anyway, like, or something like you see like a thing on the NBA report, and then he plays. So, yeah, I think there's a couple different issues that are going into it right now. Um, 
with all those being said, I will say I think one positive is I don't think the defense has gone anywhere. I think the defense continues to play pretty well. And I think that's a good note. I mean, you you hold what Golden State, I think, was to like 90 points uh, when you beat them. So I think that, that goes to show that that's still there and that will still go a long way. So, I mean, I think it's still all right there. It's more about find a way to get healthy, get your legs back under you. And, again, all this doesn't matter until that Simmons stuff is done because you're not going to – you need that next guy. So until you get your legs back under yeah. you and stuff, and luckily now the, the whole free agency thing where the free agents can't trade until December 15th, that's over. So I expect the Simmons done the deal to be done here close to the new year. Do you remember who said the – I can't remember who said it. I think it was last week, but the Sixers are a fun – like something like the Sixers are a really fun and in, like – team to watch this year but they're not a contender meaning like they're not going to be like a championship game. I can't remember who said who said that but one of the NBA analysts said that yeah. like last, last week which which is true at this point they're like a team that is fun to watch on the court at times with Tyrese you have Thibel like he did on Ding up Curry that was really fun to watch uh, well you have the moments but yeah like you're absolutely right like you just basically said it with what you said too until you complete the Simmons trade Unless if a miracle happens where you just somehow catch the fire runs that are like, you just can't explain with that magic fairy dust that just comes over your team. Like this team roster wise is not going to get there yet because you need, like for me, the, the biggest thing you need to add in the Simmons trade, and we talked about it on the phone, was the thing you said um, on the phone, which is adding in a shooter as the throwing piece. Like, obviously, you might get a shooter as a main guy. Like, if you get Buddy Heeler, obviously, he shoots the basketball very well. Uh, but then if you get, like, somebody else with the pick, that other person should also be someone that shoots the basketball well. Yeah. Because, like, you need to get more shooting on this team because, no offense to Matisse, I just commented how much I love him defensively. He's just one of those guys that's taking a little bit longer to shoot, which is fine. But because of that, you need to then supplement – that with a couple guys that can so he can just do his thing and play defense until he develops that side and then you have guys that actually shoot consistently at a level that we saw Ferk shoot in a couple games if you can get guys that do that more like Corver esque that just come in pop a few shots and go out after five minutes uh that's a little bit of I think a big thing the Sixers need, and then obviously getting one of the primary shooters, or like obviously if you could somehow get McCollum, who's an area, that'll be the area tie thing, and then you get a bunch of picks there and uh, other shooter from uh, Portland. Uh, th- that could th- th- that could work, but you, you, yeah, yeah, I guess you could, yeah, you could do that. Um, but when it comes to this team, just like you asked me about the Flyers, um, I think uh, what I want to know is. Who were the guys this far that you think are like the three people, because I think we did three in that video, that have actually stood out in a positive way that have been doing their thing this far? And then who are people that even if they say have looked good, either you think they need to step up in some facet or they just need to step up their game entirely uh, to help this team get to where we want them, not where we want them to get to, because like you said, we're limited with Simmons trade, but to be like where they were more before this losing stretch and not just a 500 team, say like four or five games above 500 at least. Yeah, I'll start with the uh, improvements here. I think in no particular order, I'm going to start with the guy you just mentioned, and Matisse Thibel. I mean, like you said, absolutely love his defense. Yeah, he'll come out, be one of the better defenders, perimeter defenders and all that, top to bottom every day, every game. But when it turns to offense, he's been a huge liability so far on offense. And I think that needs to change. You have a struggling, and this kind of leads me to my next guy, is Danny Green, who, who we've seen struggle. He needs to improve his shooting. He's supposed to be one of those shooters, and he hasn't been so far. And now you're kind of playing around, who do I want to start, Thibel or Green? It's kind of like a mismatch, like mix and match. You're trying to figure it out because neither one of them are playing like starters right now. So I think that's the biggest thing is trying to figure out which one you want to roll with. But Green might give you a little more offense, but Thibault's going to give you the defense. It's almost like you got to play matchups now, and that's more of a bench role. So I think you got two bench guys right now trying to fill the starting lineup. Um, so I think, again, you got to find a way to, to get one of those going on the offensive and defensive end, be more consistent. Um, so it would be two of my guys right there. The third one, I'd say, not necessarily his game, but like you pointed out earlier in the show, um, is – 
uh, Tobias Harris's delay game. I mean, he had a big three against the Heat to tie it up before the Heat matched that three to uh, take the take the lead late in that game. But um, if you can get some consistency from Harris in the fourth quarter, because that's the problem right now is they're doubling uh, and beating stuff in the fourth quarter because we don't have many scores in the fourth there. So I'd say Harris there. And then my last one is more of a unit, but we need more – from the bench overall uh, mm-hmm. that's where you're gonna be pretty bad and i think i read the heat game your starters were like plus 13 14 or something like that and then the bench came in and it was just terrible a guy out scored by like 25 points um so i think that as a unit outside those three players as a unit because i mentioned basically two two and a half starters um as a unit we could use improvement from the bench guys that need to just keep doing what they're doing because they're playing pretty well is maxi um he obviously started the year phenomenal, got into a little bit of a cold stretch. Team started to adjust, but he's made that adjustment back. Like I said, three straight, straight games, 20-plus points. His assist numbers are through the roof as well. Um, so I think he's made that adjustment. I think we can say he's back, and I think he'll continue to do that. Number two is Niang. I think what he's been able to do off the bench, and I'm excited to get him back. I think he's playing pretty well. He's had a lot of good scoring games as that stretch four. So I think he can continue to be that bench piece. I'll be excited to get him back uh back on the floor here shortly and third one's tough because you go obviously and beads had a weird year um it's not as dominant as it was in the past but he's had those games but i've been impressed with uh curry i feel like that guy never misses <laughs> like I, yeah I this like... has been a year that he's really stepped up for the falls of um others and then games that he's struggled other guys like that would be the game that maxi scores like 25 or something and then somebody else just picks up the pace there it's i want to give curry the edge there over mb because mb's just doing what we thought he'd be able to do nothing too dominant like last year just going out doing his thing so i'll, I'll give curry the uh, third improvement there because he's getting like 17 a game and i wasn't really i don't think anybody was expecting that really no no i wasn't and i think niang is kind of like that shooter from the four position that I was kind of talking about that pops a couple off the bench. But at this point, Green's supposed to be one of those guys that pops a few, and then you kind of mix in thigh. But wasn't it Andre Robertson? He was the guy that was the defensive guy that was on the Thunder, right, for a few yeah. years. And then they, like, would start him sometimes, and then they would put in the better shooters at times. That's what the Sixers and the Danny Green and Thibault mm-hmm. situation kind of reminds me of right now, where it's like, are we going with the guy that's just defense, defense, or are we going with the guy that – might make a three, but at this point of his career, it's like how for crossover fans, Keith Yandel is at this point where it's like, everybody really loves Danny Green. He's one of the fun guys in the game, but he's not that great anymore. <laughs> like, like he's a shell of what his former self used That's to be. Like, you, like, like, yeah, like you want to root for the guy and you always want to like, you hate saying that about guys like that, that are one of the funny guys like, always like promote people through like he does it with podcasts yandel hops on every podcast yeah. you know the man so like you hate but it, it just is what it is but um as we kind of wrap up this episode for me i would say the most impressive thing this far to me has been the way that i just think when it comes to the structure of this also i would say somebody that i think has looked fine because he's been a guy that I haven't expected to be. Like, people harp on him a little bit for his threes. I never expected Shake Milton to be a dead-eye three-point shooter. Like, he's more, of just, he's more of just a, like, find a way to score, and then if I can't, I'm going to try to get it to somebody else. I think he's been all right. Uh, he came back, and he had to work his way in, and uh, he worked his way in a little bit quicker, I thought, than uh, we would wanted him to because of other guys that went out at the time of when he came back. So I thought – He deserves a little bit of credit for kind of having to get thrown into the fire, I think, sooner than Doc probably wanted to do that. Um, And then you basically hit all the other people on the head because everybody else is the the, the bench. The bench has been struggling. I think the offense has to be more consistent because, like I said, we have those runs where you go on like one quarter where everything's sitting pretty. And then you have like a seven-minute stretch of the game where you're terrible. (laughs) And that just, like, has been really costing you. Where I think if you can get more consistency in whatever way, shape, or form, whether it's driving the hole and just getting fouls and getting it that way, 
or making your threes more consistently. But that's the big thing. So that's pretty much my closing points as we wrap this up. I don't know if you had any other closing points as we wrapped up this holiday a recap of how the Sixers have played this far as we're on, I think, the 17th, 18th, December 18th uh, now. Yeah, I think a lot of people are panicking. Um, I don't, I'm not panicking just yet. It's a long season. We've seen the Cavs, the Lakers, and all those teams struggle in the early going of the season, turn it up after the new year and look just fine. I, I think the Sixers are right there in terms of that. Again, I think I think a deal for Simmons will eventually get done. I think it'll all get situated like we've talked about throughout this show. It just takes a little bit of adjusting, and I think we'll be we'll eventually get there. I think Doc's a veteran coach that's going to be able to get the job done when he has to. And I think uh, I, I'm, it's not panic mood yet. It's too early, early for me. A long, only 30 games in. You still got 52 games left in the season. Listen, we all knew the Nets are probably going to be the one seed, right, coming into the year. I mean, even if we had Simmons, I think everyone projected the Nets fully healthy. They'll be there. Yeah. You shouldn't. You the only reason people started doubting them was when Kyrie, of course, yeah. because he couldn't play, and now he's finally coming back to play in some instances. But well, like you're you're only sitting three games back a second, so like all it takes is one good run here, and it'll be right back up there. Um, and even say you even fall down to the six, so even if even if you get the five or six seed, I mean, again, it's when you get to the playoffs, it's a whole new year. You'll get your full team back and everything. Again, this big the biggest thing for this team right now is is get healthy, get your legs back underneath you with all the issues we've had early on, and and we'll be just fine. Um, you're sitting at eight right now, which, yeah, is not what you want to do. But I think I read the year – I can't remember if it was Brett Brown's last year or the year, first year after Brown. The team won 52 games, uh, won 52 and 30. And I think they were the three seed, two seed or something like that. At this point in that season, this team was a game better than we were right now. So you figured out with that team, I think yeah. you'll be able to figure it out with this team. So my, I guess my final, po- final thought or final point would just be – don't don't hit the panic button yet. This team, long long season, long way to go. Yeah, no, I agree with that. And plus, like you talked about, the trade's going to be made eventually. Simmons will get shipped, and you'll get somebody that's actually playing for your team. Um, and even if it's like you don't necessarily get somebody to the oomph degree of what you would consider Simmons' potential to be when you do those trades, you're still getting someone that's a factor on your club currently for someone that's not on the floor. So um, that's going to be a big help. I think guys, like you say, getting their legs back under them, getting consistent will be a big help as well. But we thank everybody uh, for joining us. You can follow Andrew at AJ underscore Santangelo over on Twitter. And also you can follow me at JJ Borick 26. This has been the Sixers cast where we recap the Sixers season thus far about 30 games in at around the Christmas holiday. Have a great day and pleasant day, everybody. And please continue to subscribe down below to show the love and support. Go Sixers and enjoy the season.